Christianity claims that Jesus was crucified on Good Friday and, being dead, was buried by the evening, while his tomb was found empty the morning of Easter Sunday. One question that comes to the mind of many Christians and non-Christians is where was Jesus on the Saturday in between, the so-called Holy Saturday? Well, I'm going to try and explain this to you with this video on the Harrowing of Hell. The best place for me to start is with an ancient profession of faith known as the Apostles' Creed. Depending on what translation of the Apostles' Creed you come across, you will encounter a line stating that after Christ was crucified, died, and buried, that he descended to the dead or hell. This is taken from the Latin descendit ad inferos. In the modern world, the idea that Jesus went to hell after he died can seem a bit odd and contradictory. After all, if Jesus was a sinless man, why would he go to hell? After all, isn't hell a place of punishment for sinning? If he was God, then why did he go to hell? It turns out what we think of hell has changed a bit over time, and the concept of Christ going to hell has diminished in Western Christianity. There are a number of words in the Bible that get translated into English as hell. Oddly, one of Jesus' parables might explain in chapter 16 of the Gospel according to St. Luke, Jesus tells us the story of an unnamed rich man and a poor man named Lazarus, both of whom die. The parable tells us that the rich man is suffering in Hades, while Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. Let me say that again. We know the rich man is suffering in Hades, and Lazarus isn't in heaven, but in a place Christ calls Abraham's bosom and is separated from the man suffering by a great chasm. So is the bosom of Abraham purgatory or something? What is this place? Is it a part of hell? One clue comes to us from the extra-canonical fourth book of the Maccabees. For if we so die, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob will welcome us and all the fathers will praise us. There are also a number of other Second Temple era Jewish sources that give us some hints, while also appearing to resemble the influence of Greek mythology. But that doesn't speak to where Jesus was on that Saturday. None of the Gospels tell us where Jesus was, other than that his body was in his tomb. But we do have some hints in the epistles. In St. Peter's first epistle, he wrote, For Christ also suffered for the sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight people, were saved through water. And then again, for this reason, the gospel was proclaimed even to the dead, so that, though they had been judged in the flesh as everyone is judged, that they might live in the spirit as God does. St. Paul tells us in his letter to the Ephesians, But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, When he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. Clearly, both Saints Peter and Paul truly thought that when Christ died, he descended to the same place that the dead were going to. And not just the place that Lazarus had been in, the bosom of Abraham. In the Old Testament, there is a place the Jews refer to as Sheol, which is sometimes translated as grave or pit. It wasn't just a place for the Jewish dead, but all the dead. In the second century BC, a Greek translation was made of the Jewish scriptures commonly known as the Septuagint. It translated Sheol as 
Hades. To the Greeks, Hades was the underworld, the realm of the dead. And for the vast majority, Hades wasn't a particularly good afterlife. Within it was also a place for the really bad people needing eternal punishment, to Taurus, which also gets used once in the New Testament. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Is the Greek Hades quite the same as the Jewish Sheol? It's hard to say, but there does seem to be some equivalency. The Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches have long held traditions outside of scripture surrounding the idea that Christ descended into the realm of the dead, Hades, Sheol, whatever you wish to call it. As Jesus has a human soul, he descended to this realm and did something no human soul had ever done before. He broke out of it. But he just didn't break his own soul out. He broke other souls out as well. Did he only bring the Jewish faithful, those who would have to reside there until Christ's sacrifice on the cross? The readings from 1 Peter suggest it could have been much more. In iconography associated with the resurrection, we see Jesus rising from the grave, but also raising others with himself, such as Adam and Eve. If you've ever read the Paschal Homily of St. John Chrysostom, it is very apparent that Chrysostom himself believed that Christ went to the realm of the dead, and by his very presence did something wonderful to change salvation history. However, the concept of the harrowing of hell is still important enough that it found its way into the theology of many Protestant reformers. The Church of England's Articles of Religion states, As Christ died for us and was buried, so also it is to be believed that he went down into hell. The Book of Concord, building on the theology of Martin Luther, states, for it is sufficient that we know that Christ descended into hell and destroyed hell for all believers and delivered them from the power of death and the devil, from eternal condemnation and the jaws of hell. But how this occurred, we should not curiously investigate, but reserve until the other world, where not only this point mystery, but also others will be revealed which we here simply believe and cannot comprehend with our blind reason. In fact, even John Calvin noted that Christ descended into hell, but in his view, it was that Christ himself took the punishment and sufferings that we sinners deserve. We can even see it in modern times. In the 2004 film, The Passion of the Christ, filmmaker Mel Gibson, a devout Roman Catholic, chose to show Satan screaming in hell as a reaction to Christ's death. As the shot pans out, we see that hell looks oddly empty. The concept of the howling of hell isn't without its detractors. A large number of Protestant theologians argue against it as they don't find enough scriptural evidence for it. Some, like John Piper and Wayne Grudem, will skip the mention of Christ's descent into hell when they recite the Apostles' Creed. One commonly used argument against the howling of hell is Christ's statement to the thief on the cross. He says, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. However, the Greek word used here is clearly not referring to heaven, but paradise. Paradise itself might be another way of stating Abraham's bosom. At any rate, both scripture and tradition point to more than just Christ rising from only the grave, but from hell itself. So the next time you say Christ is risen, don't think of him simply as having come back to life that Sunday. Think of Christ as having risen from the depths of hell after leading a prison break. This video is part of 50 Days of Fabulous, a series of readings, reflections, and videos for Eastertide. You can check it out for yourself at www.50days.org.